Hello everyone. Welcome to Intro to Psychology and welcome to the intro lecture. Um, today I'm going to be going through a number of concepts uh, in psychology. I'm going to talk about what psychology is, uh, some of the key points in psychology, and some of the history of psychology and some of the uh, schools in psychology, the areas of focus. Um, so we're going to go through this slide deck and um, discuss a number of key topics, uh, some of the foundations of the course. Okay, so first, what is psychology? Okay. Um, if you look at the definition carefully, it says the scientific study of behavioral and mental processes. Uh, and this is important. Um, there are a few key words in there. The first is scientific, uh, and then you have behavior and mental processes. Okay. Scientific is important because psychology is a science. Um, and what we mean by science is, um, or are two different things. We mean uh, the approach that you use to study things. Um, and really one of the core components of being scientific is that you follow rules that limit bias, right, to keep information accurate. Um, and also science is a body of knowledge. When we talk about something that's scientific, it means that there's a body of information that we've gathered through research. Um, so scientific is important because it really is about not guessing, right? When we study psychology, the, the information that we have might change over time with new research, but we're not guessing. We're not just making things up, right? Um, we talk about behavior and mental processes. Um, behavior is everything that we do, the actions that we take, and mental processes are our internal activities, our thoughts. Um, the reason why, you know, we talk so much about both behavior and mental processes is because, you know, behavior is observable, it's objective, it's something that we can measure, right, which goes to foster the whole principle of psychology being science. And mental processes, because psychology is the study of the human mind um, and its influence on behavior, right? So um, this is just a basic intro to, to what psychology is uh, and what we're looking at. But we're going to talk about um, a few other things, right? So some misconceptions in psychology. First, one of the major misconceptions is that all psychologists are therapists. Um, when you say psychologist, you really just mean somebody who studies psychology. But just like with the law or with the physical sciences, there are so many different areas in psychology to study. Some lawyers study tax law. Some lawyers study um, forensic, uh, uh, sorry, uh, criminal law. Some lawyers study... Um, I'm trying to think of examples. Some lawyers uh, study uh, uh, contracts. Um, some psychologists will study development. Some psychologists might study um, the study of, of psychological disorders or psychopathology. Some might study uh, social psychology, right? So when you're thinking about um, the study of psychology, when you say that somebody's a psychologist, it just means that they study psychology. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're a therapist. Now, if you say clinical psychologist, that means that they're a therapist, and there's a difference. To be a clinical psychologist, you need to be licensed uh, to practice psychology. So it's a specialized area of psychology with special training that goes along with it and certifications. Um, another misconception is that, that psychology is the same as psychiatry, and the two are different. They both study the brain, they both study behavior, but psychiatrists are medical doctors. They're physicians. They go to medical school, they graduate from medical school, they, they do a residency, uh, and the residency is usually a combination of internal medicine to understand the physiology, the pharmacology, the, the, the biology of the human body, and then they, um, and then they study um, psychiatry, all of the diagnosis, treatment of disorders, typically medically, um, with a little bit of counseling thrown in there, uh, but typically medically, and, and how those things work together. So. If you want to be a psychiatrist, that's medical school. If you want to be a psychologist, um, you can kind of do any number of things, like we said before. But if you want to be a clinical psychologist, yes, you study and treat mental illness, psychopathology, things like that. But you do it uh, non-medically, right? Psychologists don't go to medical school, and they can't prescribe medications, except under very, very rare exceptions, um, which we'll talk about later on in the semester. Okay, so... Some big debates in psychology, some big things that psychologists look at and focus on. Nature versus nurture. Um, are, are our behaviors influenced more by biology, or are, are our behaviors more function, more a function of our environment, right? And, and this debate rages on. 
right? You can you can still hear this argued out nowadays, even in contemporary psychology um, and in other fields in contemporary physiology, et cetera. How much does the environment influence influence us? How much do, does genetics influence us? And obviously, it's a combination of both. But which is more, right? And depending on what you're talking about, one might be more than the other. Okay. Stability versus change, basically meaning, do we stay the same our entire lives or are we different? And there are arguments on both sides. One theory of personality or a few theories of personality say that our personality evolves and changes as we get older. Um, other theories on personality say that our personality stays the same from birth until death. Um, our behaviors might change, but our personality <clears throat> overall still stays the same. And again, we'll talk about this later on. Um, the concept of, of conscious versus unconscious, are we aware of our thoughts and feelings, or are there these forces that are outside of our awareness that are pushing us to do certain things? Um, and then free will versus determinism, basically the big question, do you have a choice? Do you make decisions, or are the circumstances, the biologies, um, anything underlying forcing you to do things, and you just feel like you have a choice, but really the choice is already made for you? Again, we're not going to answer these questions now. Um, but these are some of the bigger questions that still psychologists work on, study, and struggle with kind of every day. Okay, so uh, there are a few slides here that are just kind of for you to test your knowledge a little bit and for you to test the, the, the concepts that we talked about before so you can go through those. Quickly ask yourself, um, you know, what these are examples of, okay? All right, so a little bit of history of psychology, okay? Psychology didn't come about until the 1800s. Um, prior to psychology, the question of why um, was posed mostly by philosophers. Okay, uh, why do we do what we do? What's the influence of the mind? And for a long time, there was this concept of the mind-brain dyad, and, and it still exists, but um, it's sort of changing. Uh, it used to be that the brain was the structure in the body that influenced thought, but your thoughts were different from your brain. Right, they weren't one and the same. Um, the more we study the brain, the more closely related the, the two things are, and people argue that it's just one thing. You know, your your thoughts are a function of your brain, and they don't exist independently. Um, other people argue that it you know might be more than that. Okay, um, the original philosophers, the famous ones that, that started to talk about um, the the brain and the mind, were Plato and Aristotle, Socrates, etc. Um, and it wasn't until um, John Locke, kind of in the 1700s, uh, who talked about this concept of what they call a blank slate, tabula rasa. And we'll talk about the blank slate idea a little bit more when we get into psychoanalysis. Okay? Now, one important question, right? The nature versus nurture debate. Are we shaped more by genes, our nature, or are we shaped more by the environment? And again, it's something that psychologists and researchers continue to study today. Okay? So we're going to talk a little bit about schools of psychology. When we talk about schools, what we're talking about is um, overall ideas or, 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 or understandings, right? So um, if you talk about a school of thought, it, it's almost like a theory um, in psychology that's specific to belief sets about thought and human behavior, okay? And these are some of the original schools of psychology, okay? Structuralism, functionalism, analysis, behaviorism, and gestalt psychology. Okay, structuralism was created by a gentleman named Wilhelm Wundt, um, spelled Wundt, and basically he was studying the structure of the mind um, by looking at how people break their conscious experience of an object into its most basic elements. So he used a process that he called introspection. And basically what he would do is he would give people objects and he would ask them to describe the object. And he would analyze the way in which they go about describing the object and say that if you identify the process that they use to describe the object, then you can identify the structure of their mind. Do they look at the whole object first or just part of the object? Do they look at details? Do they look, uh, do they talk about emotions? Do they talk about movement structures, etc.? Any of these things. And if you focus on how each individual describes an object, you can get the structure of their experience. And what he used to do is put each individual down um, by themselves, give them the object, and then ask them to describe the object. And he would repeat this process over and over again. 
We typically don't use the concept of structuralism anymore in psychology, but we still talk about Bud because the way that he went about this was not too dissimilar from scientific approaches that we use today. Um, if I want somebody to, if I'm researching behavior, I'm going to put somebody in the context, in a particular context, the same setting, the same environment, observe their behavior, write it down, maybe try not to influence it depending on what research form I'm using, and describe it and then move on and then take another person and put them in the same environment. Very similar to the way Vunt did when he was studying human behavior. And that repeated presentation, that repeated setup that was similar um, is fairly scientific. So we still talk about him this day, even if only for that. Obviously, historically, he's relevant as well. James came along, William James, and basically said, um, you know, Structuralism is all fine, but it doesn't provide much benefit to us. It doesn't really help us in the long run. If the goal of psychology is to understand, um, then what we need to function, then we need to focus on is how the mind helps us, how behaviors help us adapt and survive. So instead of looking at how we think, um, James focused on the purpose that our thoughts serve, right? How does the mind help us adapt? How does the mind help us survive? It was just a backlash to structure. Now, then came psychoanalysis, right? Sigmund Freud, we've all heard of him, and who knows what you've heard of him. Um, some people love him, some people are ambivalent, some people really just have no affinity for Freud whatsoever. But he was one of the founding fathers of psychology, um, and he's definitely worth it addressing and it's been an intro lecture okay uh, Freud came out with the whole idea of the unconscious mind okay and what Freud talked a lot about was the idea that um, there are thoughts and feelings that are outside of our awareness that affect our day-to-day our -day lives and affect our behaviors um, and he said that he was it was more important to look at what was going on in our minds that we weren't aware of than it was to look at what we were doing consciously because it was those underlying thoughts that really motivated us. Our unconscious, he said, our hidden desires, our hidden beliefs, our hidden fears. Uh, and again, we'll go more into Freud a little bit later on, especially when we talk about personality. Um, but he was really focused on getting at the unconscious. Okay, so he founded a theory in psychology called psychoanalysis. So whenever you hear analysis or psychoanalysis, think unconscious processes. Okay. Um, then there was behaviorism, which was basically a response to analysis. Behaviorism was started by John Watson. And he basically said, look, psychology is a science. And in order for it to be a science, it needs to be observable. It needs to be measurable. We need to be able to verify it um, empirically. And the only thing that we can do, you know, the only thing that we can study that we can verify empirically is human behavior. So our goal should be to focus on behavior. And he was arguing that obviously behavior has to be a function of our thoughts. It has to be. You don't just act without thinking all the time. Although sometimes people argue that we do. But you don't just act without thinking. And if you don't act without thinking, then our behavior has to represent our thoughts. But since we can never truly know the thoughts, and we only truly know the behaviors, focus on the behavior, especially if you want to keep the study of human behavior scientific. So. Behaviorism focused on two different things. It focused on our environment and how that influences us and our, and our actual behaviors and how we learn information and react to things through our behaviors. Okay, and again, we'll talk about behavior more and learning more in the learning theory and in, in the learning chapter. Okay, then there was Gestalt psychology. Okay, Gestalt psychology created by Max Wertheimer basically said it's not so important to look at individual thoughts or individual behaviors. What we need to look at is the human being's experience as a whole. We need to look at how you interpret and process information, how you put pieces of information together to make sense. And as we put those pieces of information together to make sense, that's really, that really represents who we are, right? not just one idea, not just one concept, not just one behavior. How do you take in and process the world as a whole? And if you want to talk about how Gestalt psychology works on a very you know, small level, um, we can talk about the fact that the brain is constantly trying to make sense of the world and put things together to tell a story. Um, 
one of the kind of classic but silly examples of this is when you watch a movie, you look at the screen, or when you watch a TV show, when you look at the screen, you, you see people moving, talking, um, but the truth is they're not really moving. What happens is when you look at a movie, if anybody studied digital media, it's a series of still images played one right after the other in close proximity. And if you play them fast enough together, it looks like they're moving. If anybody's ever used an old flip book where you flip through a book where there's drawings of like a horse, let's say, and it's, you know, successive approximations of the horse one after the other. If you flip fast enough, it looks like the horse is moving even though it's not. The process of Gestalt psychology is the process where your brain puts those individual still images together and make it look like it's moving. This is one very small example of how the brain processes the Gestalt or, or the, the whole um, rather than the individual parts. And Gestalt psychology says we should study how the brain turns that into a whole. And if we study that, then we get a better understanding of who you are. Okay. All right. Uh, this section is just to quiz yourself again. Um, it looks back at these. What kind of early psychologist are you? Um, but I want to move on to contemporary views of psychology. What's what's what are the current views? What are the current things that we focus in, on in psychology? Okay. So some of the newer ones: social psychology. Okay. Social psychologists look at how other people influence our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. How do we act given? Uh, when we're, when we're in a certain situation. Um, what do people do? Do we act differently in public than we do at home? And the answer is probably yes. Well, why do we act differently? Well, because other people's presence influences our behaviors. It just does. Um, setting, context, everything, right? So social psychologists really study how the environment, how other individuals influence our everyday behavior, okay? And we can see that, you know, we, we act differently in front of our, our parents and then we do in front of our friends. Uh, we act differently in front of our friends than we do in front of our bosses, right? And social psychologists study why this happens. Uh, they, they help to name and identify these phenomena and help to explain them, okay? Personality psychologists look at um, our personality. Um, when we say consistency and distinctiveness, what we're talking about is who we are across different settings and situations, how we respond to different um, stimuli or circumstances, um, and what makes us unique and different. And again, we'll talk a lot about personality psychology when we get into the personality chapter. Biological psychologists um, study the physical structures of our body and our brain and how they affect behavior. They look at genetics. Um, they look at um, things like neurotransmitters, chemicals in the body, anything like that. They, they might use PET scans, MRI scans, fMRI scans um, to allow us to study the functioning and the structure of the brain and how that influences our behavior. Um, but this really is one of the burgeoning fields in psychology, right? Um, you know, one of the big fields right now is on concussions. Um, how does repeated traumas to the brain uh, affect the functioning of the areas of the brain and how does that affect our behavior? Um, a lot of people with concussions are saying that they have changes in mood, changes in temperament. Um, people with discussion with concussions, excuse me, are saying that they have changes in their memory. Um, and so people who are studying concussions, biological psychologists, neurologists, uh, psychiatrists, um, and they all might be looking at the different structures in the brain and how those have changed and what the resulting behaviors are or what the resulting changes in mood and memory are and things like that. Okay. Developmental psychologists look at how individuals grow and change throughout the lifespan, um, and they study, you know, it says, uh, the, the saying is from womb to tomb, from conception, from the moment the sperm penetrates the egg, uh, until you die. Okay, so we study the entire lifespan. Um, what influences development? What stays the same? What changes? Uh, and there are entire courses in development. Uh, you can even take one at the college called Lifespan Development, and it studies um, the entire developmental process, uh, again, from conception to death, okay? Other contemporary schools of psychology, cognitive psychologists uh, study how people think, how they remember and process information, how the information is organized. When you think cognitive, think thought. Cognitive psychologists examine people's thinking processes and how they affect their behavior. 
uh, anything related to thinking. It could be how fast you think with processing speed. It could be how much you remember with by studying your memory, um, how you process abstract information if we're talking about the study of math, um, how well you you process other information with languages, etc. Cognitive psychologists study all that, and this is also one of the schools in psychology that's burgeoning quite a bit now because it's one of the ones that we that researchers and theorists uh, spend a lot of time on. Humanistic psychologists, um, this is pioneered by Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow, and they study human beings, um, but they took a slightly different approach. The original psychologists examined people in a very abstract way. Let me identify a thought. Let me identify a behavior. If that thought process or that behavior was quote unquote disordered, let's treat the disorder. Humanists said, you know, that's very cold and that's very detached. Um, we need to take a different approach to people. We need to look at people um, as innately good people. Uh, we need to look at people as motivated to be the best people that they can be. Uh, we need to focus on them making good choices. And our role as clinicians and as therapists, if you are practicing clinical psychology, should be to help that individual become the best person that they can be. Okay, it was a very new approach. Um, and we'll talk about humanistic psychology when we get into, when we get into personality quite a bit. Um, because it was a very different approach. You know, the original psychologists and psychiatrists used more of a disease model. Identify the disease or the illness, treat the illness. Humanists, or, or, or even behavioral psychologists, you know, looked at, oh, this is a behavior, this is a consequence. Increase the consequence or change the consequence, you could change behavior. It really did abstract the human being out of the behavior or out of the disorder. And humanists said, we, we can't do that, right? We, we need to really pay attention to the person as a whole. Um, similar to Gestalt psychology, but, you know, look at them as being good. Other psychologists argue, once you start to say somebody's good, that's a value judgment, that's subjective. You know, once you start to get into that subjective world, it's not too scientific. Um, so that's one of the kind of backlashes against humanism. But we'll talk about humanistic psychology um, more as we get into personality psychology and a few other areas, okay? Industrial organizational psychology or IO psychology, it's not addressed in most of the intro textbooks, but it should be. Um, it is a huge, huge field in psychology. It is the psychology of business and industry. Um, it's a field in psychology where there's a lot of work, there's a lot of money behind it, um, and it's one of the newer fields. It's something that people are paying a lot of attention to now. Um, when you talk about industrial psychology, most people that study this end up in the field of human resources. Um, but you can do consulting work in this. You know, you're really trying to find the role of the human being in the workforce. Uh, what kind of environments contribute to people working more or working less, people getting disengaged from their job? Um, what factors influence people's retention? Why do people stay at jobs longer or not? You know, these are important conversations when we talk about a world or at least a society in which work is such a big part of who we are. Understanding the relationship between the individual and their job, the individual and their colleagues, the individual in the workforce is very, very important. <clears throat> so IO psychology is a big, big field and there are specific courses in it. Um, actually, Sydney University of New York, Baruch, uh, has degrees, um, bachelor's and master's and even doctoral degrees in IO psychology. Uh, and it's a big field. It, it definitely one, um, explore, it's definitely one that's worth, that's worth exploring a lot more, okay, if you're interested. Uh, people find the study of it can be a little bit dry, um, but at the same time, the applications of this can be fascinating. If you can change something in the work environment and make people work better or more efficiently, right? Google does this a lot. I think Google has their nap pods, and they realize that, you know, the human body needs a break, and the human brain needs a break, and they realize that people will work longer and work harder if they have that break in there rather than just grinding them all day long. So if you go to Google's main headquarters, um, they actually have nap pods in there where employees can go and take a nap for a half hour, hour during the day. And, you know, people would look back at this and say, wait a minute, they're sleeping on the job? Well, the other part of this is Google, Google employees get to work voluntarily at 6, 7 in the morning, and they work voluntarily until 8, 9 o'clock at night. And you can argue voluntarily is not so voluntary, but um, they're doing that. So any employee, any employer would say, 
if I can get somebody to work from seven to nine or seven to eight, I'd rather that, even if they're taking a nap during the day, than if they work nine to five or 10 to four and don't take a nap, right? Anyway, it's just, uh, it's an interesting field, at least I think it is. Um, socio or cross-cultural uh, perspective, this looks at um, how different cultural groups uh, affect individual behavior. So again, it's similar to, to social psychology, but it looks at and focuses specifically on culture uh, and how culture and specific societies affect behavior. And it's an important one, right? Um, because, you know, one of the, a small example of this, but uh, it is an example, um, is that there are different psychological disorders that happen in different cultures. There are disorders recognized in certain cultures that aren't recognized in others, even though the person could be exhibiting the same behaviors. So they could be exhibiting the behaviors in, you know, let's say North America, and we could consider this disordered and, and pathological, and they could be exhibiting the same behaviors in South America, and they might say, hey, look, um, there's nothing wrong with this. This is a normal part of the everyday process, okay? Um, so social psychology or cross-cultural psychology looks at how society and cultures in, in particular um, affect human behavior, and they, and they study that relationship, okay? So behaviorism and psychoanalysis uh, are still around um, as far as the older schools go, um, and, they, and they, people still study them, people still apply them, and still use them. Um, the other older schools, um, functionalism, structuralism, etc. We, we don't really use as much anymore. People don't really pay that much attention to it, although you can always find somebody who's studying it. Um, but for the most part, it really is the, um, the, the newer ones that we talked about. Okay. All right, this is the quiz yourself. What kind of contemporary psychologist am I? So you can go through and just sort of quiz yourself. And not all of the theories in psychology will be represented, but it just helps you think about it in context a little bit more and it helps you apply the knowledge. Okay. So, other important considerations in psychology before we finish up. Um, some things that we're now paying attention to, okay? Ethnocentrism, right? You might have heard this in anthropology or sociology, um, but, you know, psychology, anthropology, sociology are inherently related one way or another, right? In a lot of ways, I should say. Ethnocentrism is the belief of the inherent superiority of one's own ethnic or, or cult, uh, ethnic group or culture, okay? Um, and, you know, one of the things that we have to be careful of is that we're all subject to this. There's a potential in all of us to demonstrate ethnocentrism, to look down on other cultures, to look down on other societies. Um, and one of the things that we have to pay attention to is, you know, we talked about the different cultures and different beliefs of pathology and, and disorder. One of the things we have to pay attention to is to make sure that when we're making decisions about behavior, we have to account for the idea that normal might not be universal. Meaning that just what's acceptable in my culture might not be the same as what's acceptable in your culture. And just because your culture is different doesn't mean that it's unacceptable and vice versa. And if it's not unacceptable necessarily, it might not be considered, you know, abnormal or disordered. Okay. So we always have to be mindful of this when we're looking at human behavior, because it's very easy to sit there and look at another culture and say, wow, there's something wrong or that's got to be disordered or that's got to be, you know, mental illness or something like that. But the reality is, is it might just be a different culture. Um, so that's something to, to kind of be mindful of as you're studying psychology. Um, and then just as an example, there are different types of cultures, individualistic cultures and collectivist cultures. Um, individualistic cultures are societies where the ties between the individuals tend to be loose. Um, people's main focus is typically themselves and their own success. So, you know, in the United States, capitalism is big. How much money did I make? Um, what did I do with my career? What's my job title? Um, uh, how many properties did I acquire throughout my life? Whatever it would be, right? These individual achievements, these things that I have accomplished. Um, and then there are collectivist cultures um, where you're, you're really talking about um, is your focus on the group? Is your focus on your family? Is your focus on society as a whole, right? Um, this is one of the whole ideas about, you know, the difference between socialism and, and capitalism, right? 
socialism, you know, you do things to benefit society as a whole. Is what you're doing contributing to your local community, the global community, the environment, the world as a whole, or is what you're doing, uh, you know, contributing to yourself and your own success? And again, when we talk about ethnocentrism, the, the goal of psychology and the goal of the science and studying human behavior is not to decide which one is better. We're not going to sit here and decide that capitalism is better than um, socialism or socialism is better than capitalism. That's not the goal when you're studying the behavior. The goal when you're studying the behavior is just to understand it. Oh, that person does this because they have a capitalist mentality, mentality and this is what capitalism believes, and that's that. Or that person does this because they have a socialist mentality, and this is what social, you know, socialism tends to you know, posit, and that's that. Right? Our goal is to identify, uh, study, explain, uh, and understand. That's the goal, right? Or those are the goals. Um, so it's not to decide, not to judge which one is better or worse. Okay, but these are things to pay attention to. You know, when we're studying human behavior, uh, it's important to pay attention to it, and um, you know, truly try to identify the process so that we can get a better understanding. Okay. All right. Well, that was just a brief uh, intro video to take you through kind of some of the older schools of psychology, some of the history, some of the theories and things like that. Um, and um, we'll, we'll wrap up now. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, always feel free to email me and reach out. Okay.